Hello everybody, 2019 was a very challenging year for me. Personally and professionally, I had a lot of lows, I had a lot of highs, I said goodbye to some people, I met some new ones, and my entire life is in a very different place to what it was 12 months ago. Fortunately, I think it's in the best place it has ever been, and I want to use this energy to improve not just myself, but the channel as well. We've got off to an absolutely amazing start. I've broken my own records many times in a row over the course of the last two months, and I want that to continue. The only way, as far as I can see, of doing that is by making things as good as I possibly can, not just making as many videos as I can. One of the things that's really important to me, both personally and professionally, is confronting my prejudices. Now, for you, what that means is I'm going to be looking at cars that previously I'd perhaps written off for one reason or another, and that's what we're doing today. We're looking at this, the full fat Range Rover. I live in the British countryside where these things are basically a plague. Any time I encounter poor driving around here, it's usually someone behind the wheel of one of these. One thing you cannot deny is the fact that this car is an icon. It's been in production now for 50 years, and much like the 911, it's still very recognisable even to someone that's only ever seen the first generation of car. This is the fourth generation Range Rover, having been in production now since 2012. You would think that in today's eco-conscious, downsized world, a massive 5 meters long V8 behemoth wouldn't sell very well. But before I did this review, I popped down to my local Land Rover dealer who told me that in fact, the full-size Rangey still sells exceptionally well, and it has a very dedicated fan base. So perhaps there's more to it than just being a status symbol for small, angry women. It's certainly not a car for the light of wallet. Prices officially start at about £83,000, but if you so desire, you can spend another hundred grand on top of that. Even this modestly specified SDV8 Vogue model weighs in at just shy of £100,000. And I don't really think very many people are actually going to take their hundred grand car off-roading. And so for this review, I'm not looking at this car purely as an off-roader, I'm looking at it as a luxury SUV. The Range Rover is definitely the market leader in a segment which I know very little about. There are two cars that I'm going to be comparing this car with. Firstly, the brand new Audi SQ7. That is Audi's attempt at the gargantuan luxury performance SUV market, and is now equipped with a diesel engine that really has the numbers that compare fairly with this. On the other side of things, I'm going to have in mind the Volvo XC90, of which I drove a recent example. It also, like the Range Rover, is a few years old and is available at a cheaper entry point. But it's Volvo's attempt at the nice luxury SUV and is available for quite a bit less money. So for people thinking they want one of these, it's probably the car to consider, even though in truth it's probably closer to something like a Range Rover Sport. Unlike the Volvo, which comes exclusively with a four-cylinder engine of some description, and in its fruitiest specification, a four-cylinder hybrid, the Range Rover has a genuinely diverse selection of engines. You can have petrol, you can have diesel, and you can have hybrid. The top dog, of course, is the supercharged 5-litre V8. However, this particular car is equipped with what I think is probably the best engine choice. It's the 4.4-litre V8 diesel. It produces 340 horsepower and a scarcely believable 545 pound-foot of torque, or 740 newton meters. That is mated to an 8-speed gearbox, as with most of the rest of the JLR lineup, and of course, a lot of complicated 4x4 gubbins. It produces officially about high 20s in terms of fuel economy, and the miles that I've done so far seem to confirm that. For a car this size, that's actually pretty good. Underneath this classically styled shell is an aluminium monocoque, a first in the segment. JLR have a real thing for aluminium, and yet somehow all of the cars they use it on don't really seem to save any weight whatsoever. I found some literature that claimed that the design of this saved 400 kilos over the outgoing model. I can only assume that they've then put those 400 kilos in the boot, because I checked the official weight figures and this thing still comes in at well over 2.5 tonnes. Now, it actually looks fairly compact when you just got the thing on its own, but it really isn't. This is a big old bus. In fact, it's nearly as wide as an Alfa Romeo 4C. Unusually for a luxury press car, this one isn't very heavily optioned at all. All you have is this privacy glass, 
the Black Pack, 21-inch alloys, and the electrically deployable tow bar that JLR seem to insist on fitting to all of their press vehicles. I don't know why. These four things contribute only to about £3,000 of the car's final 98 grand price, which is a nice surprise. On first glance, the standard equipment list is actually pretty good. You've got four corner adjustable air ride, you've got matrix LED headlights, you've got the fixed panoramic glass roof, you've got a little cooled compartment between the seats up front, and an electric version of that iconic split folding tailgate. And if you're the sort of person that insists on taking their all-wheel drive vehicle out the moment it snows, just to prove it was worth it for that other 364 days a year, the Range Rover has you covered. As you might expect, this has class-leading all-wheel drive, a proper twin-speed transfer box, and a whole host of driving modes to cover every eventuality. Look a little closer though, and you will find some strange spec omissions for a 98,000 pound luxury car. There are no soft closed doors. There is only a reversing camera with front and rear parking sensors, and the seats are only heated. If you go for the Vogue SE, which is another six and a half thousand pounds on top of that, you'll get your soft closed doors. You get cooled seats all round. You get proper 360 degree park assist. And you also get the 21 inch alloys that are a 1600 pound option on this car. You get better leather for the interior and you get a better stereo. So for me, the Vogue SE seems like a bit of a no brainer if you're already gonna spend this much money. First impressions of the interior though are very good. This Windsor leather, even though it's not Land Rover's top, is nice, is supple enough. The seats are extremely comfortable. I like the way that the buttons on the steering wheel work. They're very clever. However, in typical JLR fashion, the screens in here are a little bit behind the best. This digital driver display, which is standard on this car, is just a wasted opportunity. It doesn't really do anything that analog dials didn't. The screen here, again, is good enough, but in contrast with the competition, particularly, say, the new Audi, it's just not good enough. And this screen down here is kind of clever, but also a little bit laggy, making it somewhat frustrating to use. You've got this cool and quirky double sun visor up here, a Land Rover trademark. But nowhere in here will you find a wireless phone charger, a curious omission and something which points towards the car's elderly platform. However, all of the switch gear in here feels very premium, as it should, and there are some nice touches, like the two glove boxes in case one of them breaks, and the gesture control for the panoramic roof. Which I think needs the ignition on. Although it's no Maybach, the rear of the Range Rover is an extremely nice place to be. These seats are very soft and comfortable, and you've got a few nice luxury touches too. There's this huge armrest in the middle with cup holder and cubby hole. You can adjust the backs of the seats electrically. You've got five and 12 volt sockets for you and your passenger. In this particular car, heated rear seats, four zone climate control, and you can even do little things like you can send that passenger window down from this side, or indeed open or close the big sun blind for the panoramic roof. It's a pretty good place to spend time, I think. Crucially, as you'd expect, rear storage space is also generous. You have the classic Range Rover split folding tailgate with both sections operated electrically, like so. And thanks to the car's air ride system, if you need to load something heavy, you can even lower the whole back of the car, like so. You can even send the passenger seats forward electrically from a pack of buttons back here. Pretty good. Other than a few missing features, it's actually looking pretty good for the Range Rover at the moment. However, as they say, the proof of the pudding is in the driving. So I hope you'll join me for part two, where I take this big beastie down my local favourite roads and see just what it's like to be that guy. See you for the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>